So again, welcome to this presentation on homeopathy. Um, the kind of homeopathy that we're going to be discussing this evening is what's known as classical homeopathy, which was um, created by a German physician, Samuel Hahnemann, about 200 years ago. And this is what I practice and have been practicing um, for over 20 years and teaching for 15 plus years. Um, it's a wonderful system of healing, and um, I'm really happy to share this with you this evening. So homeopathy belongs in a branch of medicine that you would call vitalism. Um, I have a YouTube on vitalistic healing that you um, can observe, that you can watch on um, which is about a little bit over an hour long, and it explains what vitalistic healing is. Basically, you can approach uh, health and healing from one of two perspectives. You can think of your body and really everybody's body, every living thing, and the whole planet and the whole universe as something that's alive and full of energy, or you can treat it as if it's a machine. And many systems of medicine treat the body more as a machine, you know, it needs a little bit more of this, or take this off, you know, cut this piece off, replace it with this, you know, kind of like going to a In that way it has on an energetic level. And has more in common with uh, acupuncture and even Reiki than it does with um, allopathic medicine or mainstream medicine, even though we use little white pills and it seems very medical in a certain way, but it actually is an energy medicine and it's based on this concept of vitalism, that your body is an energy system and it has a, your body as an energy system has a connection with other energy systems in plants, in other people, um, there's a resonance going on. Another way that we can classify different ways of treating disease um, includes um, antipathic, um, substitutive, and homeopathic. So first I'm going to, and I'm going to go through each of those, so um, I'll explain antipathic first. Anti means against, pathy means the, um, the disease. So antipathic treatments are basically going against what your body is trying to do. A good example of an antipathic treatment is um, if someone um, has a fever and you take an aspirin or a Tylenol, that brings the fever down. So your body is trying to produce a fever and this fever may be a beneficial thing. It may be how your body is trying to overcome um, the infection that you have. And then, so your vital force is doing this, creating a fever, and then you have the antipathic um, medicine coming and, uh, and putting it down. Am I muted again? No. I hope everybody can hear me. Somebody said they can't hear me. Um, can other people hear me? Shana? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you, Shauna. Okay. So, um, anyway, so this kind of treatment is a good thing if life is at stake. Of course, if somebody um, has, a, has had a stroke and they need a medicine that's going to dissolve the clot and open up um, that artery again, of course, um, the antipathic medicine is saving a life, so it's a good thing. Um, so as an emergency medicine, antipathic treatments are good. I don't think there's any, any kind of medicine that's inherently just evil and bad, but it just depends on whether there's something that's more supportive of the vital force. And antipathic treatments have the effect of suppressing the vital force. So if you rely on antipathic treatments um, a lot of the time, you're basically weakening your vital force. Um, so taking an aspirin 
taking an antihistamine, anything with the word anti in it. You know, if you're having an allergic response and you take an antihistamine to get rid of the allergic response, you're basically suppressing what your body is trying to do. Uh, so that is an overall effect, as I said, of um, basically suppressing the vital force and weakening the vital force. Substitutive treatments are ones that are doing the job of the vital force. Here we see some insulin here, like uh, um, somebody with um, type 1 diabetes whose body is not producing insulin, and then we give insulin as a medicine. That's a substitution. Um, and, and again, substitutive uh, treatments can uh, save lives, so uh, it can be good in the right um, arena. Another example of a substitutive treatment is actually an antibiotic and that's something that's definitely overused because um, if you take an antibiotic for an infection basically the um, the antibiotic is doing what your vital force should be doing, what your own immune system should be doing for you. And again if you have a horrible infection um, that you're, is overwhelming your system and you're going to die, of course you should take antibiotics. Um, so again, it's a spectrum as to when, how, you know, when you can use some kind of supportive treatment because the substitutive treatments, again, um, the, you know, it's the old uh, slogan, uh, use it or lose it. So if you're relying all the time on substitutive treatments, your vital force is not, you know, working and taking care of your um, taking care of your problem and bringing you into balance itself. So again, substitutive treatments are useful and in some cases completely necessary, but if you can do something that's supportive of the vital force instead, that's uh, better for your long-term um, health and vitality. So a home homeopathic treatments, and by homeopathic treatments I mean um, I mean anything that supports the vital force. Homeo means similar, pathy means to the disease. And so things that are homeopathic are um, what support your vital force in trying in doing what it's trying to do. Um, and this, I use this picture because one example of this on a sort of psychological level is a support. So which way to go? Um, he, here we have a little child with a fever. And again, you know, this is always an individual decision as to what kind of treatment to use. If life is in danger or there's danger of some kind of permanent damage, of course, you know, go for the antipathic if you have it. But if you have more time and the person is pretty strong, like with a fever, you might want to try, like a child with a fever, you might want to try some belladonna or some aconite or a homeopathic remedy first and see if that helps them um, and helps to bring the fever down, especially with fever because fever is a sign that your vital force is working and uh, trying to um, overcome uh, the infection. So, you, you know, you have to decide for yourself, but if you learn some homeopathy, you'll have some other options. Um, I'm going to see if we can mute people because it's really loud. The founder of homeopathy was Samuel Hahnemann. Um, he, these are his dates here. He was born in 1755 and he lived all the way to 1843. I think he wrote his first edition of the Organon in something like 1810, if I'm not mistaken. Um, in any case, he was a physician in Germany, um, and he was also very, very brilliant um, and was translating texts from uh, different, langu different uh, European languages, translating medical tests for a living. Um, and so he read an interesting um, statement in one of the texts that he was reading which said that chincona, which is uh, quinine, Peruvian bark, worked on malaria because it was bitter. And by this time, by the way, he, had already, he was not practicing medicine because he felt that the doctors of his time 
were doing more harm than good. They were putting leeches on people and dosing them with toxic, um, toxic drugs like mercury to get rid of syphilis. And so he was doing this translating instead. So he read this statement and he decided to try some quinine bark, some Peruvian bark. And what he found is that he developed chills and fever, which are, uh, you know, main symptoms of malaria. So he developed um, a hypothesis or a theory that a substance that um, creates symptoms in a healthy person then um, will cure those same symptoms in a sick person or like cures like. So that became homeopathy, and um, that is how homeopathy was born, was basically out of a disgust for um, Western medicine as it was being practiced at the time, and a man with a very inquisitive mind who liked to experiment <laughs> on himself. So he wrote this book, see I was right, <laughs> he wrote it in 1810. Um, so it's been around for over 200 years, 204 years at this point, and he called it the Organon of Medicine, and this is still the, um, this is still our main textbook in our course today. Uh, so that's how reliable his information is. He was really an amazing, amazing person. Uh, one of the things he wrote, um, for example, was that, uh, at the time, people with mental illness were considered to be possessed by demons and they were being punished by being chained and whipped and basically treated as if um, they had deliberately done something wrong and were treated very, very brutally, just horribly abused. And he said, these people um, should have our sympathy and compassion because they have an illness. So he was clear-minded enough to see what people in the society, in the normal society, could not see at the time. So he was really a revolutionary and um, very modern and high-tech in his own way. I mean, if he were here now, he'd be doing all the high-tech stuff, I'm sure, because he was very, very progressive and very much of an independent thinker. Um, he had a huge issue with... Um, physicians who did not make their own medicine because he felt that the whole pharmaceutical industry at the time, if you can believe it, uh, more than 200 years ago, was just completely um, corrupt and that the only way that you could get around it was by making your own medicine. So he was absolutely insistent that doctors should be making their own medicines and never buy things from a ph pharmaceutical company. <laughs> so you can see some things some things haven't changed all that much since Hahnemann's time. Um, at least in our country, it seems mm -hmm. to be the pharmaceutical industry just seems to be a huge lobby, a huge uh, money-making lobby. Um, so that is an interesting, interesting point. And, you know, he had a, a very strong personality, too. He was quite bullheaded. Um, and so... Uh, he made a lot of enemies, but of course he also had lots of people who admired him and just were in awe of what he was doing, because not only did he create this incredible system of medicine, he, he cured sev uh, several horrible epidemics uh, that were going on um, at the time, and actually hon um, homeopathy's brilliance and fame really came through the treating of epidemics, of epidemic disease. It's really an incredible. Um, we should do we should do um, a class just on epidemic disease because it's just really fascinating. So as I mentioned, um, like cures like is the main principle of homeopathy. So a substance that causes um, symptoms in a healthy person. In this case, we have coffee, cof which um, as a homeopathic remedy is coffea cruda. Uh, so if you drink a cup of coffee, it makes you um, makes it hard to sleep, makes you awake. Um, but if you take it homeopathically, coffea becomes um, a remedy that cures insomnia. So like cures like. 
in a healthy person, coffee keeps you awake. So if you're awake and having trouble sleeping, if you take homeopathic coffee, it's going to help you sleep. That's like cures like. Here's another example, um, another one of our best remedies for um, colds and allergies when you have like a really runny nose and your eyes are tearing is Allium Sepa, which is red onion. And of course, anybody who's ever cut open an onion uh, knows what onion does to you. It causes all of this tearing and um, also some nasal discharge and burning in the eyes, etc. So. Um, Again, like cures like. Homeopathic allium sepa, um, great remedy for um, hay fever and um, cold. So how did Hahnemann find out what remedies do? Now, we took some examples here of remedies that are pretty obvious because they're everyday household substances like coffee and... Um, and onion. But um, there's also um, a lot of substances we don't know what they do. And I also did give the example of Peruvian bark. So what Hahnemann set out to do was do what he called provings, which was to take a substance over and over and over again and see what it did to him. And so that's what our Materia Medica, or are the descriptions of the remedies that we have, which are called Materia Medica, um, are based on provings. And many of the best provings that we still use today were done by Hahnemann. And it's so different uh, compared to allopathic medicine where um, uh, actually at my graduation from homeopathy school back in 1993 or 92 I think I graduated in 92 um, we had a medical doctor who was also a homeopath come and give the commencement speech and he took a big PDR physician's desk reference which is this big huge thick book which I think has to be reprinted every single year and he threw it on the ground and said this is the gravity of the situation he said this book is out of date all the time whereas our homeopathic materia medicas they're never out of date we're still using the information that Hahnemann gathered uh, sometimes things are expanded and there are new remedies that are proven but um, the system remains the same and the information that we have on remedies we don't say oh oh no that doesn't work anymore we didn't mean that or oh it didn't it, you know there's this side effect for one thing homeopathy doesn't have side effects but uh, the information just expands. It doesn't. It doesn't go out of date the way that um, allopathic uh, medical information does. What do we use for remedies? Um, again, um, we use not just plants and not just minerals, but also animals. Um, so a remedy can be from any kingdom: animal, vegetable, or mineral. In the animal kingdom, um, apis, for example, is bee venom. Um, it's a great remedy for stings and swellings, etc. There are quite a few snakes and spiders in the homeopathic Materia Medica. Um, we have different kinds of milk, including human mother's milk, which is um, a really useful remedy uh, for people who had you know, birth trauma, things like that. Um, and we use the Latin names. so. Even if two homeopaths are talking to each other and they speak different languages, they may, um, they may not be able to understand everything they say, but the, the, the names are always the same because we use the Latin names for all of our remedies, whether animal, vegetable, or mineral. So in, um, from the vegetable kingdom, lots of herbs that are used medicinally are also used homeopathically. Um, but also foods um, are used, as I've already mentioned, coffea and onion as two examples. Onions and coffee are both homeopathic remedies, as is uh, milk. So um, it, there's, well, milk is, uh, milk is from the animal kingdom, but anyway, 
uh, vegetable kingdom vast amounts of information and when homeopathy spread to India um, and uh, became huge in India I don't know if you, I think there are a few Indians on this call um, but in India there are homeopathic medical schools for your medical colleges um, there are homeopathic hospitals where you can get treated for cancer and heart disease and all kinds of things. We've really, in our course, we um, have some Indian doctors who teach some of the advanced lectures and the kind of work they're doing is amazing in India because homeopathy is just a kind of mainstream medicine. Um, so anyway, in India, when uh, India really discovered homeopathy, a lot of the Ayurvedic herbs started becoming homeopathic remedies as well. So we have some interesting um, additions to the homeopathic uh, materia medica from India as well. And in the mineral kingdom, um, we have a lot of different minerals. Um, one of my teachers, Jeremy Scher, has the uh, goal to prove the whole um, the whole periodic table because then we'd have a whole kingdom done and so he's been working on that I was actually um, part of the neon proving I I did a couple of provings with Jeremy Scherer and learned how to do provings from him uh, so provings are still being conducted to this day and um, this is the periodic table um, and yeah a lot of these have already been proven and the salts which are the combinations of different ones for example natrum muriaticum, calcarea carbonicum <coughs> many of our mineral remedies are very important for children very important constitutional remedies a good example which I had just mentioned earlier is natrum muriaticum um, so natrium muriaticum is sodium chloride, regular table salt, and it is one of our top remedies for migraine headaches. It's really amazing. So when we use it just in a regular, um, you know, cuisine, it's just doesn't have a medicinal quality. But when it's potentized, when it's dynamized, um, it it uh, gets a medicinal quality that yeah is superb for migraines, hay fever, um, long term grief. These are some of the keynotes of Nature Muriaticum. Another principle of homeopathy is dynamization. So. When Hahnemann, uh, his first principle was this uh, like cures like, that you take something that causes those symptoms in a healthy person and you give it to the sick person. Uh, the problem with this is some of the substances that, he, that cause problems in healthy people are pretty toxic. So he, dis he created a system of dy dynamization which releases the energy of the substance um, while letting go of the side effects so there's no longer the actual substance but we just have the energy of the substance um, available to us and this is done through a process of what's called dilution and succussion where it's put in water the substance is put in water and succussed um, which is basically shaken or pounded and then uh, put into another dilution this is how homeopathic remedies are made and um, this system for doing it was actually the homeopathic pharmacopoeia was put into um, the FDA at the beginning of when the FDA was founded back in the 1940s and is still there so homeopathy is actually regulated by the FDA It was one of the first things to get F regulated and so the whole system of preparing homeopathic remedies um, is registered with the FDA interesting fact. <laughs> so here's uh, somebody uh, doing dilution and succussion as I was mentioning earlier. Um, you can, this is done in, in a pharmacy where she's actually pounding the remedy um, on the um, on the bench there. I think uh, Hahnemann was doing it on a Bible, so kind of a leather book. So in the pharmacy they're doing it on this leather table here and then after succussing it uh, the correct amount of times a drop of that is taken and put into a hundred drops of water 
and that's um, how you make C potencies. C means 100, so it means one drop of the original solution in 100 drops of water is a 1C. And then you take, a, after succussing, you take one of those, put it in the next one, that would be a 2C. So when you're getting a 30C, you've actually, that has happened 30 times. And so there are no, um, there are no molecules of the original substance left in the vial at that point. It's a pure energy medicine. And so we're really talking about the um, border between energy and matter here, which is very much um, being discussed in the new, in the new physics, where um, waves and particles and that, that place where energy and matter intersect. So when you get a homeopathic remedy in a f um, in the store, they're they're not in these quaint little vials. Mostly, you're getting the boron blue tubes, which are decent remedies, but they are on little lactose pellets. Um, and one thing that's good to know is that you really don't need to, need to take a lot of them, and taking more isn't necessarily stronger than taking less. So uh, even like, for example, if you use oxylococcinum, which is a great um, remedy for preventing flu, uh, and they give you those little, those little vials that are about that big, and they tell you to take the whole thing, which is actually a lot of sugar, uh, you can just take a few of those little pellets, and you can, that one little vial can last you a long time. Now, Boron may not want you to know that because they want to sell you more medicine, but actually you don't need that much. You just need a couple of little, the little balls. Now we're going to talk about some remedies and uh, talk about some cases. Uh, well actually I'm just going to talk about how uh, a kind of interesting way that Arnica is used. We're not quite up to the cases yet. You may already be familiar with Arnica. It's uh, the most common homeopathic remedy because it is so useful um, in all kinds of um, trauma, especially physical trauma. Um, you might experience uh, sore or bruised pain after an injury anytime, anytime you bump yourself or hurt yourself or have any kind of trauma, um, especially a head injury, going to the dentist. It's a great remedy um, for stroke. Um, can help after stroke. It can help um, during labor and after delivery of a baby. Um, bruises, sprains, um, after having um, surgery to um, keep the swelling of the tissues down. It's also, it's not on this list here that I'm showing you, but it's also really a great remedy for um, jet lag. So it's a good thing to carry along, although uh, if you're going on an airplane, it's best to try to keep your homeopathic remedies from getting x-rayed, which means they have, when you go through security, you need to hand them uh, over to the officials and ask them to look at it and not have it be go through the x-ray machine. So it has many, many uses, um, yeah, gout, malaria, meningitis, and one of the keynotes is that um, if you're in an arnica state, everything feels kind of bruised and sore, and the bed may feel too hard. So uh, the pharmacist at Hahnemann Pharmacy, Michael Quinn, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago of a stroke, created um, this um, this medication, which is just Arnica, but he packaged it as an allopathic medicine and is being used by plastic surgeons um, who are doing facelifts. Um, I've seen it sold in allopathic pharmacies all over the place. It's called Cynic. And basically, it's Arnica in um, a few different kinds of potencies, and it's, being, it's for before and after surgery. And it's to help people who know nothing about homeopathy um, in fact, Michael Quinn, this pharmacist, told me that the plastic surgeons who were evaluating this product that he made um, knew nothing about homeopathy, knew nothing about this medicine that was being prescribed, but they could see by measuring 
a, a profound difference in the amount of swelling that their patients were having, those that were given the um, Sinec and uh, compared to those that weren't. So the plastic surgeons, again, who don't know anything about homeopathy, and some of them didn't, um, and during the study, you know, didn't know what was in this medicine, um, were completely convinced that this medicine really, really helped um, their surgical patients and then therefore helped the surgeons because people were recovering faster and having less swelling. Okay, so now we're going to start talking about some homeopathic remedies. Um, and the first one we're going to talk about is aconites. We have the ABCs of the nursery. We're not doing all three today, but the ABCs of the nursery, meaning the ABCs for children, is aconite, belladonna, and chamomilla. Those are three great remedies for children. So today we'll start with the aconite. When in fright, take aconite. It's a great remedy for acute fright. Um, it covers the three Fs. It, when things come on fast, when there's fear, and when there's a fever. So fast, fear, and fever. These are some of the ways I have my students remember the important points of remedies is by having these little um, things that help your memory. It's good um, when things, when ailments uh, like a high fever or a cough comes on after being out in a cold, dry wind, or after having um, uh, experienced a very strong fright. It's really the state that you go in when you have acute fright, like if you just had a car accident and you're in shock and you're freaking out and feeling like, you know, you almost died and things like that. In fact, um, this presentiment of death and predicting the time of death are um, two famous uh, keynotes of aconite. And again, this example of a really frightening experience like being in a car crash and saying, oh my god, I almost died, I think I'm going to die. That kind of real, uh, real intense terror and fright that comes on very, very quickly due, um, due to a sudden shock, basically, shocking, um, shocking and frightening um, occurrence. Uh, in terms of acute um, disease, there may be restlessness and a very high fever if a child wakes up in the middle of the night after having played outside in a cold wind and he's got a really high fever and he's very, very frightened and having nightmares, etc. Um, it's a great remedy in croup um, and also in earache. When babies are born, sometimes from the birth trauma, they aren't urinating and it's a good remedy for that. Um, as well. It's also helpful in heart attack um, with the same kind of feeling of death is right around the corner. Toothache um, with, you know, again, very intense and hepatitis. And another, it's also another remedy for stroke and eye infections. It really has many, many, many uses. Um, so I'm going to read you a little poem about aconite and then read you a case that a student had done. So this is a poem um, by David Warkington. Um, he wrote this back in 1986. Um, Anxiety, anguish of a crowd, vague greatest fear, can name day of death and thinks it is near. Of fever, inflammatory, above is a part, night aggravation, tumultuous heart. In beginning of fevers, the sine qua non, tingling pains, taste is bitter, save water alone. Use if skin is dry and hot while covered parts sweat. Muscular hypertrophy, don't you forget. Neuralgia after cold west winds, amenorrhea from fright, pulse frequent, full, both tense and hard, each subject sanguinous quite. Look out when croups to choke begin, likewise for hemorrhage red. Use also for congestions in single parts as head. So anyway, some of it's a little funny language there, but um, it's another way to kind of remember the remedy. But definitely the three Fs, fear, fast, um, I'm sorry, fast, fear, and fever, and when in fright, take aconite, and this cold, dry wind, etc. So here is... Um, a case that a student did um, that they handed in as part um, of their studies. 
It's an, a case of acute fright. I was dropping off my children at school, and I saw my good friend Judy. She seemed somewhat shaken and asked if she could talk to me outside of the school. Judy had recently had a swollen lymph node removed. They had reassured, they had assured her that it was almost certainly an infection, although it had been resistant to antibiotics because she had had a negative mammogram just one month before. When I walked outside the school gate and saw her face, I knew what she was going to tell me. It's bad, Jan, really bad. Outside of the sight of her own children, um, she broke into gushing tears. They found malignant cells. They don't know how bad it is yet. They could say, I'll be dead in three months. Uh, Judy had been up all night. She was in a complete panic. The possibility of death was right with her. She has two small children. Tell me I can fight it. Tell me I can fight it. Of course I did. She spoke of her fear of losing her relationship with her children. She would hold her hand over her heart and then remind herself to breathe when she spoke of this. After comforting her as much as possible, I gently offered that a remedy might help her deal with the initial shock. She was very receptive. So this is an example of aconite when you, you receive some very shocking, frightening news that makes you feel like you could die very, very quickly. So yeah, this is a typical kind of case where aconite would be helpful. And indeed, the aconite helped this woman um, deal with her intense fright around the cancer diagnosis. Next remedy is another one that um, has a lot of acute emotional um, uses, which is Ignatia Amara. And Ignatia, just as um, aconite is really good for acute fright, Ignatia is good for acute grief. When um, there's been a death in the family or some horrible um, Disaster has happened, and many people have died, and you feel, and your main, your main feeling is grief and sadness um, at some kind of loss or some kind of huge crushing disappointment. You really had your hopes set on getting into a certain college or getting a certain job or have something that you really, really want to see happen, and then your hopes are crushed, um, and you're very, very sad. Um, there's often a lot of spasming, twitching around the mouth, a lump in the throat. When you see somebody in acute grief, you'll see a kind of twitching, and the, they may describe having a lump in their throat. There may be a lot of sighing. Um, some other keynotes of aconite, um, which may or may not be present in this um, acute emotional state, include an aversion to fruit and an aversion to tobacco sauce. Uh, no, tobacco sauce, tobacco smoke, sorry. Um, and if somebody gets sick after um, having a sudden grief or loss, it's good for headaches, environmental illness, chronic fatigue syndrome, asthma, bulimia. These are just a list of different um, conditions that have been helped by aconite. So here is a case of aconite by a student, a case of perceived humiliation. A young student is very upset. Here are his words. It's really hard to talk about it. This just happened today. At the inaugural meeting of our class, everyone was supposed to go on stage and introduce themselves. This was somebody who was actually in our homeopathy school um, and one of the students um, in the program where I was teaching. I made an utter fool of myself. I stuttered, mispronounced, couldn't get the words, the right words to come out. I felt totally humiliated, really crushed. I simply can't get over it. The scene keeps repeating over and over in my mind. What an idiot I made of myself. I'm also really disappointed because I sensed some hostility from the people there, and I thought I was finally going to be with a group of people I could really vibe with. It feels uncomfortable to swallow food as though the food passages have narrowed. Observation, he seems to be pushing back tears now and then and is taking frequent deep sighs. So he has the sense of disappointment, feeling crushed, his hopes being crushed, and he's got the sense of, um, ten of, uh, of spasm and constriction in the throat. 
and is sighing a lot. And uh, Ignatia helped him with this. Gelsimium is a great remedy for flu. And so if um, most parts of the country, the kinds of the way the flu symptoms evolve is often different. But gelsimium is one of our top remedies in many flu epidemics, including um, a, the flu pandemic back in the early 1900s. Gelsimium did remarkable things for people. And it still does do remarkable, uh, remarkable um, cures of flu. Um, it's this typical kind of state um, where um, you, in fact, I'm going to tell my flu story because it has to do with my homeopathic studies. Um, I was really, really excited to start studying homeopathy. This was back in 1990, I think. <laughs> so, that's how long I've been doing this. And I was going to be in the first class um, that, uh, that was being started by this school and this were the first time uh, people who were not already health professionals were going to be able to study homeopathy in the United States in like a hundred years um, and go through like a whole professional program. There had been one other school but they only took medical doctors and they had been around for a few years, Hahnemann, Hahn, Hahnemann Clinic. <clears throat> but I went to Pacific Academy and I was so excited about studying homeopathy and a few days before the class was supposed to start, I started getting a really little bit of a tickle in my throat. And then slowly, slowly it evolved into my head was really dull and I was set as this is describing here. Um, You feel like your head is just in a fog, drooping lid, lids, heavy limbs, weak, dull, sleepy and trembling, um, thirstlessness. Um, and the interesting thing is um, it, it covers what we call ailments from anticipation. It can cover, uh, it can come on because you're so excited and that's really what it was for me. I took the gelsemium. I went to see my homeopath, took the gelsemium. Every time I took it, I fell sound asleep and um, sweated like crazy. But unfortunately, I caught it too late. And um, that was the only class in my three-year program that I ever missed was the first session of my of school. But anyway, that's my gelsemium story. So it's also good for anticipatory anxiety. For example, if you're going to take a test or you need to get up on a stage, um, and if you get weak and trembly and your mind stops working, um, it can, and especially if there's diarrhea involved with the anxiety, uh, gelsemium can be very helpful. So it's a remedy for flu, but it's also a remedy for anticipatory anxiety or just anything that happens, um, even ex you know, being excited and, uh, about and anticipating something that's going to happen and the excitement uh, bringing on this um, trembly, dull, um, tired, uh, foggy state. Here's another case, a student case, a case of droopy flu. A young woman had the flu. Since Sunday, she had been feeling very nervous and anxious about her upcoming wedding. She also found out that her best friend wouldn't be able to come. So she's having this kind of anxiety that we're talking about. Throughout Monday, she had episodes of trembling and weakness and some sneezing. Monday night, her menses started. She was very tired, but still found it difficult to sleep from the excitement. Then during the night, she woke up with hot and cold sensations up and down her back. Again, these chills going up and down the spine. Very characteristic of gelsemium. At bedtime, she developed a headache that felt like a band around her head. There was tremendous aching in her eyeballs. She feels droopy and heavy all over. So it's a very typical gelsemium case. <clears throat> Arsenicum album. This is uh, homeopathic arsenic. 
And this is a really great remedy for panic attacks and general anxiety. Um, when some kind of disaster happens and people feel like the universe is kind of out of control and you want to get things under control and want to get everything back in its place, um, there's a lot of compulsivity about arsenicum, of not really being able to, one of the um, things we study in the Materia Medica says, unable to rest unless things are in their proper place. So wanting to put everything back where it goes and somehow feeling like there's some kind of reassurance that happens mm -hmm. by having everything be where it, it, it um, should be. There may be some chilliness and some wanting heat. Um, a strain, what we call SRP here, um, this says SRP, strange, rare, that means strange, rare, and peculiar, meaning an unusual thing that kind of points to arsenicum kind of is when somebody has burning pains, but those burning pains actually are better, feel better when you apply heat. Normally you'd think burning pains would be worse from heat, but with arsenicum kind of, they may be better from heat. They may be thirsty for small sips of um, something to drink and just taking little tiny sips if you go and visit them um, in uh, in the in bed and you know if somebody has a flu for example and needs something like this uh, the discharges coming whether it, it could be a cold it could be a flu it could be a cough arsenicum really is good for so many different ailments it's one of our major remedies um, food poisoning flu allergies um, intestinal problems including colitis insomnia when the person is really restless and can't sleep at around one in the morning. It's even a great remedy in eczema. So um, we use it a lot. Arsenicum is really important, but in terms of acutely how you would be using it at home, you know, for um, kind of simple things probably would be um, have to do with food poisoning and flu and also just, you know, if, if, you, uh, if you have some insomnia or occasional anxiety. Um, one thing I should mention is that the examples I'm giving are of acute homeopathy. Uh, this is the kind of thing you can do at home, like if somebody has a cold or a flu or there's an you know, acute fright, like um, a person just got a bad diagnosis and they're frightened or that kind of thing. But when it's a chronic problem, like if somebody has chronic asthma, chronic insomnia, anything that either rip comes back repeatedly or they have all the time, which is the case in a lot of cases, you really need to see a homeopath for that because it's too complicated to try to treat that at home. You have to look at the whole picture of what's been going on with a person from birth. And uh, that level of homeopathy takes many years to study. And we teach it in our course. Um, but what I'm teaching you here is some remedies that you can use at home, you know, for these more what we call acute conditions. Acute conditions have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and then you're done. Whereas most of us, by the time we're um, middle-aged and these days even earlier, on, many of us have chronic problems, you know, things that just don't go away. Chronic joint pains, chronic headaches, chronic depression, chronic anxiety. Those kind of things we, you really need to um, see a homeopath for. So food poisoning is one good example of um, how uh, homeopathy can help. Um, for example, uh, somebody went um, to uh, Mexico for a spring break and ate some foods that they don't normally eat, um, including a lot of spices, a lot of chilies, and maybe some things that weren't so clean, not really sure, and then develops a really severe diarrhea and vomiting, and the, and the diarrhea is just burning, burning you know, the area around the rectum, and um, this is a really typical thing. And then taking a dose of arsenicum, he falls asleep, and when he wakes up, the symptoms are like 90% better. So that's, arsenicum is really the remedy you should carry with you when you go traveling to a country and are, um, that where you're going to be eating some kind of country like Mexico or India are two places I'm thinking of specifically. Um, where the weather is warm, so there may be pathogens that you're not used to, um, bacterias and things like that that your body's not used to. And when you eat the food, especially if you eat some raw food or you eat, um, you know, that hasn't been cooked, 
um, or you eat some chilies that your stomach isn't used to, you may develop these kind of vomiting, diarrhea, and arsenicum is often the remedy that people need in those circumstances. And finally, uh, the last remedy I wanted to talk about is Bryonia alba, which is known as the grouchy bear remedy. If you remember grouchy bear, you'll know about Bryonia. Um, person um, who needs Bryonia um, can be very hot and irritable, doesn't want to be disturbed, just wants to be left alone, really dry, really thirsty and any kind of movement at all, even the eyes, even moving the eyeballs can hurt. Um, and it may feel better from pressing or lying on the painful part. And it's a great remedy um, for acute appendicitis. Um, I know of several cases of um, appendicitis where people were on their way to the hospital, took bryonia on the way to the hospital, and by the time they got there, uh, the appendicitis had started to resolve and they didn't end up needing surgery. Um, it's also a great remedy in fractures, that kind of guarding that people do. If you've ever seen somebody who has had a fracture, has broken a bone and hasn't had it set yet, the way they guard it, and they don't want anybody to touch it because any movement is excruciatingly painful, Bryonia will help um, with that. And especially headaches. Bryonia is a great headache remedy especially if um, there's a feeling of kind of like the head is going to burst. So here's a case um, presented by a student of a grouchy husband. Uh, the student went, came home one day to her normally sweet husband and he was just sitting there pressing his head and um, just looking like he was in intense pain and he just said, uh, leave me alone, leave me alone, um, you know, my head just hurt so much and he was just really cranky and really, really thirsty and really hot and grumpy. Um, so she, having studied homeopathy, recognized the signs and gave him a nice dose of Bryonia 30C and within 15 minutes the headache started to resolve. So that's the end of the presentation for today. Um, I would love to answer your questions. Um, if so, what I'm going to do uh, is um, just you can go up to the floating bar up at the top of the screen, and I think you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah. Does anybody have a question? I just heard an unmuting. I think. Anybody have a question? Well, what would you... Well, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi. Okay, so this is Susie. Hi. Hi, Susie. Hi. Yeah, so what, what, um, so these ones that you uh, recommended this evening, what would you, what brand would you recommend that we actually use, just an over-the-counter brand? Well, you know, um, Boron is fine. Um, you can get those Boron 30 C's in Whole Foods or in your local health food store. Um, so I think uh, 30 C is a good potency. If you're not sure if it's the right remedy, you might want to go for a 6 C or a 12 C. We'll be okay. talking a little bit more about potency uh, in our next class in part two. Uh, okay. But yeah, but okay. I, I think the boron is fine. Um, for students in the program, I usually recommend that they buy kits where you get a lot of remedies. Um, you know, you can get a hundred, you know, fifty or a hundred or three hundred remedies, and the price comes down quite a bit if you're buying large amounts of remedies. So, so what, what what kits would you? Re I don't really like the Byron ones. I like I like the uh, like the Highlands have they dissolve. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just prefer those because I use them on my dogs and it's easier for me to use them as well and just for kids, you know, those little hard, little sugary balls, I don't really like them. But what do you what do you recommend for kits? I like the Bengal Allen kits um, that are sold well, what's that? What's that brand called? Uh, B-E-A-N, sorry, B-E-N-G-A-L, Bengal Allen, A-L-L-E-N. And they're made in India, but there is a distributor... His name is Kanishka. He's a very nice guy. Um, and I'm forgetting the name of the website, um, Natural Something or Other. But if you Google Bengal Allen, 
um, you, I think you'll come up with uh, his website. And he has kits that are very nicely okay. priced. And um, many of I've been using them now for about mm, four years or so. Um, I use Hahnemann Pharmacy okay. Remedies quite a bit too. But now for my kits, I've been buying Bengal Allen kits because I've done a lot of traveling. I've gone to India and done service there. Uh, treating people in um, places where there's no um, medical treatment and things like that. Um, so I was. What was the other brand? You uh, just, just did another brand as uh, well. Hahnemann, Hahnemann Pharmacy. Hahnemann Pharmacy. Hahnemann, just like Samuel Hahnemann. Hahnemann Pharmacy is uh, who I usually okay. use. Those are expensive. Um, uh, oh, okay. okay. But uh, the Bengal Allen are very good, good quality and good price. So. Yeah. Okay. Hope that okay. helps, Susie. Well, thank you for that. That's great. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? Okay. So in part two, um, we're going to go into actually how some a little bit about how you take an acute homeopath homeopathic case, how you gather the information. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about potency, and we're going to go over five more remedies. We did five remedies today. We're going to do another five next week, and along with their cases. Uh, I also would invite you to go visit our website, homeopathytraining.org. Um, <clears throat> on the lectures page, there are uh, many lectures that I've done on different topics, allergies, children. There's one on um, flu and epidemic diseases that I did with an acupuncturist um, many a few years ago that gives some of the information about epidemics. So if you're interested in epidemics, you could listen to that. So you might want to look at the lectures page, especially uh, the lecture on the top of the lectures page is an introduction to the Caduceus program. Uh, so you could listen to that if you want to learn a little bit more about how our professional level program works. Um, because we have, as I said, a complete training in homeopathy. It's all done. <clears throat> it can all be done via distance learning, and we even have a clinical portion where we send you DVDs of chronic cases. Um, so, yeah, this is something that is doable from home. I'll just check in one more time to see if you have any questions. Well, thank I'm fine, thanks. Okay, well, uh, well uh, I, might email you. I might email you some questions here. That's fine. Okay, well, thank you all for joining, and I look forward uh, to seeing you uh, next week in part two. Um,